Hello YouTube. Uh, I wanted to do a video today about another image with this guy, the Officina Stellare, uh, professional ultra corrected RC, uh, the CRC320. It is a very, very good telescope. It is an astrograph. Uh, it is a 1680 millimeters at 5.4 focal length and speed. The aperture is 12.5 to 12 and a half inches. This is the mirror. The telescope itself is rather heavy. I have it here and I'm going to move it around a little bit. It has a nice looking baffle tube that I've reflocked. So if you see some material on, on this tube here, it is because I decided to flock it a bit more to get better contrast, which worked. This thing here that's out of focus is the uh, secondary adjuster for distance. So if you move this in and out with the special key you get, it will move it uh, inside or towards the outside. Um, you do that to perfect your uh, curvature and your field flatness. Uh, so the stars will be round across uh, corner to corner. But then you have some adjustments here to move the mirror incrementally to collimate it. Um, it has uh, some beautiful contrast when it comes to the design. It's red, like you can see red elements here, red elements on the back of the secondary here um, and the back itself is all red so it's a very beautiful uh, telescope aesthetically not just from a specification point of view now this is uh, one of the first images that I'm going to show today is when I actually removed the secondary baffle that was another tube that was on here that created this weird effect uh, that I showed in previous videos this is also it has a heater uh, here so this little thing heats the back of the secondary so it doesn't get due. Done. It doesn't get due. Uh, it's pretty good. There's a hub at the back that controls that. The primary also has one of these and there's also fans. So this telescope, because it's a truss tube, meaning these carbon fiber tubes, trusses hold it in position, it can, it's more susceptible to dew and to humidity changes. Now I use a shroud usually when I image that's placed on, on uh, where the trusses are, so it uh, negates any off-axis light that you might get. The image that we're going to look at today is the Orion Nebula. Of course, the Orion Nebula is a very popular target. There's even a 3D image from NASA that shows it. Um, the Orion Nebula is a vast star-forming region where young stars are born from collapsing clouds of gas. Uh, there's intense radiation and powerful winds in the area from these stars that that these are responsible for illuminating and sculpting the beautiful nebulosity that we see today. Now, the image itself is taken last year, uh, December and January, when I had some clear skies. This year, I don't have any clear skies because we have a lot of rain, which is really good, uh, but I cannot image, so I'm just reusing all data. I think the images are really good, so um, I'm really happy to, to share them. Now, this telescope itself, is much heavier than let's say a C14 or an ICF14 or even the GSO uh, truss which is longer than this just because it's built from more solid aluminium and it's much more sturdier and stiffer um, and uh, it, it came at a price back in the day when it was, was made. So Officina Stellari almost makes custom telescopes because they're they're very very good but they're also not affordable to most consumers. I was lucky enough to buy this um, as a uh, quote-unquote lemon or broken telescope and managed to get it back to life just like the Honders. So with that said, let's take a look at the image in PixInsight and let's see what data I captured. So the first thing that's going to come to mind when talking about this target is the center. It is called the trapezium. The, the, num the stars that are in inside the core here, they're called the trapezium. Now, there's a lot of people who have opinions on this, especially people who've shot this once or twice. Now, this is the reality. A lot of the times the core will look blown out because the core is very bright and that's the first thing you see when you, you capture Orion. Um, but it depends on your camera. If you have a camera that has enough stops of dynamic range, mine has about uh, 14 or 15 as this specific configuration, you don't have to worry about it. The best test is to take a couple of images, stack them, 
stretch them and then do a um, HDR multi-transfer to see if the core actually comes back. And I've had enough people tell me that, oh, you've overexposed the core, you've done this, you should take two different sets of photos and then stack them. I've done that in the past. Yes, for most instances, that might be the case, but I actually did a bit of research when I shot this and I realized that I'll, I'm happy, I'm good uh, with what I have. Now I have about 16 hours of data here, six hours of hydrogen, five hours of uh, oxygen and five hours of sulfur. And at first glance, you might think that the code is basically gone, but it's not. It, it will come back very, very, um, uh, very well defined uh, once I, I stack and stretch the image uh, in the LRGB uh, format. So the stars are really good. Now I spent a bit of time when I imaged this to align uh, the diffraction spikes to the camera sensor so they look like uh, instead of looking at X's, they look like pluses. Now, it took a little while of rotating the camera from the back to get this effect, but I was really happy when I got it. It just, it, it felt right. Uh, when I set this telescope up again in a couple of uh, weeks, I'll do the same. I just like the way it looks. It's very clean and very organized. Um, the hydrogen data looks really good. The Orion Nebula is very rich in hydrogen. This is the first time I got to see the telescope without the extra baffle and the star size was very, very nice, very small, uh, very manageable. The diffraction spikes are very thin. So these are all um, things that I was trying to achieve with this telescope. Small diffraction spikes, smaller stars, so that the nebulosity takes center stage. Uh, sulfur is not as uh, prevalent in the nebula, but it's actually enough that creates a very beautiful um, image out of it. The stacks look good. The stars are a little bit bigger here, I guess. It might have been the, the seeing that night, but I think it's still manageable. Um, in some instances with cheaper filters, you would see uh, these stars extend quite a lot. Now, there's actually some flaring going on here on sulfur, and I believe that what happened was my filter wasn't perfectly straight. Now, I was using the QHY600 camera and filter wheel, and I wasn't using the 3D printed adapters that somebody makes, somebody called Joel Short, he's amazing. He makes these 3D printed adapters for QHY and ZWO. I highly recommend buying them uh, because you will not get tilt in your uh, filters, and more specifically, your filters will not crack. The stuff that comes with the filter wheels is not good. They're cheap, they don't hold, expensive filters properly and if you spend a lot of money like I did on filters you don't really want to use 10 cents or a dollar worth of spacers or, or um, the plastic stuff that holds your filters so uh, I think his, his uh, nickname is Star uh, Buckeye Stargazer or something you can find them with Agena Astro and a bunch of other shops he sells these specifically made for QHY, Chroma, Bader Astrodons, ZW filter wheels. Uh, they're very good and they'll help your filters uh, stay intact. Now again, probably a little bit of tilt here. Um, it's the same with oxygen. The filters weren't properly straight uh, put into the filter wheel, but I think this is all manageable. These halos are not a big deal and they through probably a couple of uh, different techniques they'll go away. Now after this I stacked the image and I got a pretty good result. Again, the core still is blown out. You can start seeing detail in here. And by this point, I knew for sure that the core is going to be uh, workable and the details are going to be nice. The nebula, there's a lot of oxygen in this nebula, so that oxygen is going to be pretty uh, workable and the blue is actually going to be pretty intense. There's also red from sulfur and, of course, there's uh, luminous data from hydrogen and the yellowish tint that comes with it. Um, after I removed the stars, um, I did a couple of processing with the high dynamic uh, HDR multi-transforming, excuse me. I did some curve stretching, some saturation, and then I removed these kind of stamps that came from the halos um, to clean it up. Now, the image already looked really good. Uh, there's not much noise in it because again, it's a pretty bright nebula. It looks really good. Um, not much was left. So after I kind of cleaned it up, did, the, did some color mixing, I ended up with this. Now you can see the core is actually very visible. 
this is a starless image because I hadn't put the stars back in, but it looks really good. The oxygen is actually the main um, channel that's been exposed here. The, the kind of brightness of it, the detail of it is really good. The sulfur also kind of contrasts everything and kind of creates this beautiful 3D look like uh, it looks like the Orion Nebula has arms and kind of embraces the oxygen. It is very beautiful. Um, I was really excited with the result. All that was left was to do some noise reduction and to bring the stars back in. So I did just that. And the stars are very small. Uh, I used a star reduction algorithm here, not the blood exterminator. The blood exterminator was not used in this image. So it's just regular star reduction that was applied before the stars were brought in. Not much processing happened. It was very simple. It literally took me maybe 30, 20, 30 minutes to process this. Um, I did have some deconvolution steps that I took, but the detail in some of this nebulosity, again, I couldn't be happier. It's a beautiful image. And this was actually the first image that NASA published as part of their Ape What's Notable series um, sometime this year. Um, and then after that, there was quite a few others, but this was the first image that NASA ever published, uh, as a notable, didn't win an APOD yet, but it, uh, definitely caught NASA's attention. So this is my Orion Nebula in narrow band. I would love to shoot this in broadband from a dark end of sky. I am, I would be really excited to see them on luminance and colors that's there, but again, with my, uh, conditions. I try to shoot this many times with other telescopes in broadband or, you know, regular RGB, LRGB. Uh, I could never flat field it out. The noise and the muck that was coming from the uh, light pollution always made it to kind of impossible to have a good image. But I'm curious to, to think what you guys think about this image. Uh, I actually showed a version of this in one of the Telescope Express's live sessions last year, and it was very well received. And I think I, I think I could do better uh, with maybe a larger telescope and a mosaic. But I think with this, I'm done shooting it, and I'm gonna focus more on other targets, like smaller targets like Thor's helmet and a few others. Um, now, the other thing I'm going to do probably in the next couple of days is record another video with older technology. Now, I know it's it's easy to say, oh yeah, the QHY 600 or the IMX 455 is one of the best CCD CMOS, sens uh, sorry, CMOS sensors out there, not a CCD. And it's easy to get great data, but I actually have some older data that I took with a CCD sensor, an older sensor, a Moravian 16200, that I recently processed. Of the Thor's of Thor's helmet, it was taken with the old trust telescope. It wasn't even the expensive uh, corrector; it was some cheap reducer that I used. And I'm going to be showing the results you get with uh, less sensitive. I think I didn't even have chroma filters at the time; it was butter filters. But I think the final image is a very tight balance between processing, equipment calibration, frame calibration, and just aesthetics. Now, I could have easily blown this image out and I could have done something like this, where this image would be overly saturated, maybe to brighten up, pull the darks out. This would have been something relatively simple. So this is where I think it helps to test out to see what each individual photographer style like, what do you like, what people like, and what do you want to put out there? So for me, there's always a very um, big decision uh, towards the end when the image is almost ready to see how much do I push the saturation or how much do I stretch it? How much do I uh, pull more details out and kind of get weird artifacts from it? Or do I get weird artifacts from it? So again, I am lucky that I've been working as a designer for a long time. So some of these in decisions come easier for me because again, experience, but I think there's plenty of examples of people oversaturating or oversaturating the images or pushing the dark, the black point to, uh, to dark. So that's something everybody has to figure out. It's their style and their type of uh, processing. This is my style and this is my image. And 
I shall see you in the next video. Hopefully I can do that uh, in the next few days so you get to see the Thor's helmet reprocessed image with an older CCD. The one thing I would say is the exposures on that video, uh, on that image are 30 minutes per, per single image. So <laughs> I was exposing for a long time back then and that was just because the CCD wasn't as sensitive and because I could, the mount easily made it happen and the noise floor was much lower because of that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this image and don't forget to uh, hit me up if you have any comments and I'll see you in the next video.